Today's message is out of Matthew chapter 10, verses 26 to 33, and it is a message that's dear to my heart because I love proclaiming Jesus. Uh, if I could, I would stand on the rooftop and sound the trumpet and say, Jesus is my Savior. I don't have a problem doing that. I know that uh, at times there are, are moments when I am so much in a hurry that I don't want to share because I have to be over here or over there at times. And so I don't, and I do definitely feel very guilty about that. And so we're going to be encouraged by today's message as Jesus uh, basically encourages us not to fear, not to fear those that would attack us like they attacked him in sharing our faith with others and being very bold with it. You and I really should be willing to share, if not shout, our relationship with Jesus Christ from the rooftops. We really should. A true believer totally understands that. He is so intimate and in love with Jesus that he has no problem in letting people know, I love Jesus. And so I'm hoping that you will be encouraged to reveal your relationship and not hide it from others because hiding the gospel from others should not be a part of a disciple's life. It really shouldn't. As disciples, our heart should be to expose Jesus to a dying world. So as we get into the text, let's understand the context of it all so that we, we don't get out of context. And so Jesus is equipping his disciples to go out into the community there in Jerusalem and share the gospel message with as many people as they possibly can and do it very quickly because they only have so much time. So if you knock on the door and they refuse you, walk away, go to the next door. And if they open up the door, then stay in with them for a day or two, get fed, and then get off again and take the gospel out. Uh, he said, if I have done certain things, then you need to do certain things. If they persecuted you, they will, um, if they persecuted me, then they will persecute you also. And he says that in verses 23 through 24. And he says, when they persecute you in this city, verse 23, flee to another, for surely I say to you, you will not have gone through the city of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of the household? And so be prepared as a believer in Jesus Christ to be persecuted as Jesus was. I think it would be safe to say that whatever Jesus went through, we should be going through. Well, wait a minute, he died on the cross, yeah. So we need to die to ourself. Wait a minute, they persecuted him, yeah. So if you open your mouth, uh, expect someone to laugh, expect someone to say, you're stupid, expect someone to say, you're an extremist, you know, you will be persecuted too. And if you love, expect others to go, wow, just as they did with Jesus as he loved. You know, one of the things that amazes me about Jesus, and I think it just sticks out so much, is his kindness. Jesus was just a kind, kind person. He always looked for opportunities to be kind to those around him. And that's one of the, the attributes of Christ. It's one of the things that Paul tells us in Corinthians that love is, right? Right, it's kindness. And we forget that simple word of kindness. Being kind to your spouse, not being mean, but being nice. Being kind to your neighbor, saying a kind word. You know, a kind word will diffuse anger, the Bible says. It's amazing what kindness will do. And so we need to take on that characteristic of kindness too. So this morning's message is a healthy fear, a healthy fear. What is a healthy fear? Well, Jesus will define what a healthy fear is for us today. So let's look at verses 26 to 33. I'm gonna point out a couple of things and then we will get into the observations of the text and then interpret it. It says, therefore, in verse 26, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those 
who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hair of your head are all numbered. Now, I really offended people on that statement there of Jesus in the first service because we talked a lot about losing our hair. And Jesus doesn't have to count that much, but we'll get there. Then he says for the third time, do not fear. Therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So get your highlighter out and highlight verse 26. Do not fear them. Fear number one. Don't fear them. He says this three times in the text. In fact, Matthew uses fear three times, and they're all in this text, in his whole gospel. Verse 28, and do not fear those who can kill the body. Highlight, do not fear those. And then 31, do not fear, therefore. And the whole purpose of having a healthy fear is verse 32, and you might want to highlight that whole verse. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will confess before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father in heaven. That's a scary scripture. What is he saying there? And we will define that for you, whether it means he will separate you if you deny him, he will also deny you, or whether it's talking about rewards. So first point, verse 26, therefore, do not fear. Do not be afraid. Do not worry. Do not be anxious at those things that are happening around you. At who? At the religious leaders of their time. That was their immediate enemy. It was the religious leaders, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the religious sects. They were the ones that were coming at them. They were the ones that were following them. They were the ones that were questioning Jesus, questioning the disciples. They were the ones in the temple that said, he's one of them too. And so that was their immediate enemy. You can almost imagine being a disciple of Jesus Christ and Jesus' teaching and, and, and on the corner of your eye, you see the religious guy back in the corner, you know. And you could pick them out because they had their robes, their phylactrophies, their tassels on there. And they're standing there like this, you know. You always can pick out the critical ones in church because they're, hmm, I was one of those at one time. But you can always pick them out. And they're, I can just imagine them going, there they are again. <laughs> I wonder what they're going to ask this time. You know, of course, they would scream, Jesus! So if a woman and a man get married and the man dies and then she marries his brother and then he dies and marries another man and another man. So now she's married to seven men and they all die. Who's she married to when she gets to heaven? Hmm? And Jesus like, oh man, they really got me. <laughs> you know? And of course he says, there is no marriage in heaven. Thank God, right? <laughs> all of you go, oh yeah. <clears throat> no, really, thank God. Wow, it is hard. Marriage is hard on earth. It definitely is. Just like Bible study is hard. You know, this inductive Bible study, don't think it's easy. I mean, it's going to take some work. You're going to have to dig in. You have to observe. You're going to have to interpret. You're going to have to apply. And application is always the hard part of, of our relationship with Christ. I can remember when I first started reading the Bible, man, I would get headaches. Because I'm not a reader. I, I never was a reader. I was great at sports. I loved to run. I loved to uh, play track and, and football and bat. Oh, I loved basketball. I'd do it all day long without hurting. But reading, I just never picked up a book on my own accord. You know, I just like, nah, I don't do that stuff. But when I started reading the Bible, I would literally get headaches just from focusing, reading, trying to understand, trying to you know, uh, bring it into my heart. And literally for years, I'd always get headaches. And, and there were times where I, I can't read anymore. Stop. <laughs> I, Lord, I, I don't want to do this. And I think it was the enemy, but also my mind being trained to read. Now I don't have a problem. I can read all day long. Usually this is my day. I get up in the morning because I'm an early person, get up at five o'clock and I try to get done with everything by 10. I need to get done. And then I take the rest of the afternoon and I study all day long till I go to bed. 
Uh, I'm in my bed and I'm just reading books. I'm reading commentaries. I'm studying for this day or that day or this event and this and that. I'm preparing for Sudan and I'm just studying all day long till I go to bed. And that's usually my day. And I don't get any headaches anymore. Yes, it's work. Relationships are work. Uh, battling against the enemy is work. Christianity is not an easy thing. But you and I should always be excited to share Jesus Christ with others. And if I can be clear, and I don't want to use the word frank because I think I'm always frank with you, but my heart is not that this church grows just because we want growth, but that we grow so that we can be more effective in this community, so that we can be a church that reaches out and people can see our light shining on a hill. That's the reason that I want to see this place filled up. I want to see souls saved first and foremost are you saved do you personally have a relationship with jesus christ i mean personally not a superficial relationship a deep intimate relationship with jesus christ is he your everything because he is my everything and i want to shout from the rooftops that he is my savior and you should too because Jesus said for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that not will not be known what is he saying there and in the context well anything that's covered up whatever that is it'll be uncovered a dog will come up and dig it out, and there it is. Oh, there's, there's, has it been all this time? You know, I was good at, at finding things on Christmas because I knew where they would hide them. They tried to cover it up, but I'd go find them, and then I'd open them up, and I'd wrap them back really nice, and they never knew. The hard part was being surprised when I opened it up. <clears throat> the thing that's hidden, whatever that is, it's found out. It's found out. Eventually, everything, that, everything is going to come out and everything will be in the open and, and everyone will see and everyone will know. And I think in the context here, as we look at the context of what Jesus is doing with his disciples and preparing them in verse 28, we see Jesus is describing the judgment that will come where at this judgment, everything will be disclosed. Everything will be uncovered. Nothing will be hidden before the Lord. The problem is we only know partly. We don't know everything. If you were to take a pie chart <clears throat> and the whole thing is knowledge, information, how much information do you know? Could you just leave the whole pie chart open? Probably not. Maybe, maybe half? Some of you like half? I don't think so. How about a quarter of that knowledge? Do you think you have about a quarter of the knowledge that's out there? Eh, eh, I don't think so. How about like one in a hundredth, maybe, you know? Okay, maybe some of us. There's a lot to be known out there. There are libraries and libraries and libraries of things that are out there. And we don't know them all because we can't judge hearts. We don't know what's hidden, what's covered. Only God knows. And God is the one that will bring it to light. First Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until what? The Lord comes who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsel of the heart. Only God knows the heart. I don't know it. I oftentimes get people to come to me and they will pour their heart out on how the other person has so many problems, but they'll never tell me about their problems. You get an application for ministry and all you see is good stuff because they want to be in ministry. You don't see the bad stuff. They don't want the bad stuff. You're applying for a job. You're going to tell them all the acclimates. You know, you're going to tell them where have you been, what you've done, how successful. And they're going to go, wow, we need him. We need to pay him good money to keep him. But get someone that's honest and sincere and transparent. See, that's what the Lord wants. Going to Sudan, there's a big application to fill out, and they're asking me all kinds of questions. And one of the questions I thought was interesting was, how do you handle stress? You know, I thought to myself when I was answering that, I could put on there, I, I totally trust in the Lord. 
I give it to him immediately and I'm at total peace. What a great answer that would be, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart, you know? Just trust in him. But I said this, after I get angry and upset and, and I get stressed out and then I realize I have no control, I then give it to him. And that's the truth. Now I can say that because you all do that too. You all get angry. You all get upset. Maybe not all of you. There might be a few of you. That's honesty. That's being transparent. See, ultimately, God will reveal the heart. And so I can't deal with the heart. I can only deal with what's said. And I'm hoping that as God speaks to you and ministers to you as his children, that he will deal with the heart. And that's what Corinthians is saying. It's the Lord who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsel of the heart. And then he ends that scripture and says, then each one's praise will come from who? From God. From God. Because God knows your heart. One commentary said that these two principles are apparently intended to supplement each other. So the first of them probably is dealing with God and how he conceals and he reveals. The second one may be how we conduct ourselves as men when we deal with God and how we cover things and how he then uncovers them. And that could possibly be. Ephesians 5.13 says, all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. And so all things will be made manifest. God will, will, will reveal the intent of the heart because he knows it. When you shine a bright light <clears throat> into a dark place, darkness runs. We're going to have the opportunity to have light here. God has just been blessing us tremendously. It's amazing. You know, we're a smaller church than we were last year. We've lost quite a few people, and that's fine. Uh, I've seen it for 30 years, come and go, and that's fine. I'm at peace with that most of the time um and i just know that's just the way church is but it's amazing what god is doing even though we're not as big because we have that modular unit Uh, the lord brought somebody that is taking care of all the lighting for the whole place i'm talking about parking lot lighting talking about lighting for this little area that will make it shine like the sun already we have light on this side for wednesday night evenings and then around the trailer now and so this place is going to shine it's going to be a light in a dark place and that's what i'm hoping is that jesus will be known here that it will be his love that will be known well what does this fearless behavior look like look at verse 27 whatever i tell you in the dark speak in the light And whatever you hear in the ear, preach on the housetop. That's what it looks like. In other words, whatever Jesus tells you secretly between you and him, you need to go out and preach it without fear. You need to proclaim it and not fear anyone, what they will say, what they will do, how they will treat you because, and he'll tell us that in a minute, we should be bold enough to get the word out. Now, he could be referring back to verse 19 of chapter 10 when he says when they deliver you up do not worry about how or what you should speak for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak for it is not you who speak but the spirit of your father who speaks through you and so what the father gives you to say say it that's the application speak it you know all of you are are, are very much different Uh, we're all different And we're all at different places. And I totally get that and understand that. And and so whatever God is telling you personally and what's going on in your life, in your relationship with him, just share that. I I receive from people oftentimes, well, I don't know much. Well, what do you know? Did Jesus save you? Yeah, he saved me. How did he save you? Well, this is how he saved. Well, share that. You know, it's Super Bowl Sunday. What can we do to share our faith with our families and so forth? How about praying for your food? We should be doing that already. When I first got saved and we went to our first Thanksgiving dinner back at Virginia's house, me and her got together and we prayed before we ate food. And they were all like, 
what's going on there. You know? And eventually, after the years, they were like, Reuben, would you like to pray for the food now? We became a witness to them. So at the Super Bowl, pray before your food. And if it's your house, you have every right to say, we're going to pray before we eat. I'm not coming here next year. That's fine, but we're going to pray before we eat. Be a light. Don't have alcohol there. Don't stumble people. Don't let them bring alcohol. It's your home. If you're at a place and they have alcohol, that, that's fine too. Just don't drink it. Don't be around it. Don't let them convince you to have one, you know, because you're a party pooper. You know, stand up and be a witness. Wherever you're at, be a witness. Jesus said, what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetop funny that at that time the housetops were pretty much flat and so they had a lot of parties up at the housetop they would do a lot of things up there recline relax they'd even prepare for the sabbath day they would blow their trumpets on the sabbath day six times they'd blow it the sabbath day is coming the sabbath day is coming and and they blow it loud enough that everyone in the field realized oh the sabbath day is getting near let's go get home before it's too late you know and if you were the stores oh, oh the sabbath is coming let's shut everything down and so they were preparing everybody for the sabbath day they were proclaiming it from their rooftops if you go to israel friday evening you will literally hear sirens and you'll watch people and they're like with all their groceries and their kosher food getting ready to go home and and have the passover and probably the best time to travel in israel is from friday evening to saturday because it's like a sunday morning all day long there's no traffic and you can go anywhere at any time really quickly uh, it, it's beautiful we are to get on our rooftops and we are to proclaim that we know jesus and do not fear for the second time he says in verse 28 those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul the body is mortal it will die and if you die and they let you lay there long enough, you'll deteriorate. You, you see those shows, right? And all of a sudden you're dust. You're gone, but you're dead. Your soul is eternal. That's who you are. Now, I don't know the ins and outs of all of that. I mean, there's theologians who still are talking about the soul and so forth, but that's who you are. That's who the mind and your whole makeup, who God created you to be. Whether it's, it's a smoky mist when it comes out of you, who knows? I don't think it is. I've seen plenty of death. I don't see nothing coming out of them, you know, but their soul definitely leaves their bodies because I literally see their bodies go <clears throat> as their soul leaves. Their soul goes to be with the Lord. So their soul is in the presence of the Lord. Old, young, child, baby, immediately. Uh, abortion, immediately with the Lord. I have several uh, children who were lost uh, in miscarriages that are grandchildren that are with the Lord right now. The bodies, they come later. At the rapture, when the Lord sounds the trumpet like an archangel and he proclaims that it's, he's coming, then the bodies that are dead in the ground will be caught up in the air and meet the souls a new body and i believe it's the age of 33 uh, jesus is our example always our example we always point to him and and we'll know all things as he knows first john tells us and he'll reveal everything to us and it totally will make sense so whether you're old young or even a child you will know all things he'll educate you instantly like that and that child will become a 33 year old perfect specimen of what a human being should be like that's my idea. I think there's enough scriptures that you could hold that to be true, but I entertain other thoughts too. Uh, that soul lasts forever. Fear the person that has control over your body and soul. That's who you should fear. That's healthy fear. You have no control over my body or soul. The religious leaders of our system have no control over our soul. Our government has no control over our body and soul. They may kill our body, but they can't kill our soul. But God does, and we should fear him above all. Well, what are you saying by fearing him? What do you mean? Should I be in dread of him? No, 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 no. If you're a child of God, you totally understand that he is your father, and he loves you and cares about you completely. And so you don't have to fear him to that degree, but you understand that he is in total control of your life. And so the point is don't fear anyone else. Don't fear anyone else because your father's got your back. 
He'll take care of you. Rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Gehenna, eternal damnation. Not annihilation, but eternal suffering for those who reject Jesus Christ. There are, there are some now that are teaching that hell is just a temporary place and then eventually God's just going to annihilate them all. That's not true. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. Compared to Hades, Hades is a temporary place. It's where people go now and they're being held until that day, probably in the center of the earth somewhere. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He makes a clear picture of that in Matthew chapter 3 when he talks about um, going out with the willing fan in his hand and he's taking the harvest, the wheat, throwing it in the air and the shaft lands in one place and the wheat lasts in another. You take the shaft and you burn it up into hell, an unquenchable hell. Someone asked Cromwell, a commentator, preacher of the word, why he had so much... Um, boldness in his life and he replied I have learned that when you fear God you do not have to fear any man at all now don't misunderstand me I'm not saying that that you become arrogant with that because we shouldn't be arrogant with that we should not be going well I don't fear you because God's on my side well that's arrogant and pride you should be humble with that truth that when you're preaching the gospel and proclaiming him, you don't have to fear what men will do with you. And he's not saying that we're supposed to fear Satan or even be afraid of him because greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. And so we don't have to fear him at all. So a healthy fear is understanding our relationship with God, our Father who loves us, who even says that we're friends. And we don't have to worry about what others say or do to us because absent from the body is present with the Lord. So this warning encourages Jesus' disciples to remain faithful, you know, in spite of the opposition. Look at verse 29. He gives us uh, illustrations with uh, sparrows and with hair uh, to prove his point. He says, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, which was very little. Uh, sparrows were available. They were uh, offerings that the poor gave because uh, they just couldn't afford a lamb. So they'd go to the market and you'd have a string of spar sparrows there. And you would purchase one or five, depending on what you needed, pay your pennies, and then you'd go offer them up as a sacrifice. And so God is saying here that if sparrows, which are sold for a small amount, I mean, it's an insignificant amount. It's, it's, you wouldn't even want to worry over it. That's how insignificant it is there. Um, and it's used for leprosy, and how many people do we have walking around with leprosy? Not a whole lot. We do have some, but it, it's not a big deal, he's saying here. And yet he says, not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. This insignificant little tiny bird who falls to the ground falls because the Lord willed it, and he's totally aware of it. It's amazing when we used to have um, the power lines on Wineville. You remember that? And no homes over there. You remember all the birds that used to just sit on the power lines and you'd watch them. They make these beautiful picturesque things, you know. Well, I really believe that those guys were daredevils. Because I would drive by and they would sit up on that power line. And as soon as I came by, they're like, all right, let's ready, let's go. And they fly right in front of me. I think it's on purpose, too. And, and they just, whoosh, it's tiny little birds. And all of a sudden, I hear something like, oh, did I get one? And then I knew it was a game, so I started attacking them. And no, I didn't do that. But I would watch them, and they'd go be sitting on the little curb. They're go, ah, he missed us, you know, that type of thing. If God's concerned about those little tiny birds, little daredevils, how much more is he concerned about us? Not one of them fall to the ground apart from the Father's will, he says. God knows completely the littlest things, the littlest details. He knows it all too well. He knows you. He knows me. He knows what causes us to tick. He knows the insides and outs. <clears throat> One of the hardest things for a pastor to remember, and, and I'm speaking from the place of a pastor, not a teacher, 
is that people are hurting. It, it doesn't matter who you are. Because I have seen people who are very wealthy hurting and very poor hurting. And there's a lot of drama going on in their lives. A lot of drama. And they wouldn't dare share any of it with anybody. From anxiety to worries to cares to fears. And it's very real to them. And as a pastor, you have to understand that. It took me a while to understand that. I was so excited about the word. I'm like, just do the word and you'll be okay. But where's the compassion behind it as they're suffering? Because they have drama in their life. You have drama in your life. I know you do. I know I do from time to time. We all do. And how we get through that is very important. Knowing that God loves us, who loves the little sparrows of this world. He said back in Matthew 6, 26, look at the birds of the air. For neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than them? Matthew 26, 6. Wow. So if they are taken care of, how much more will you be taken care of by your Father? And then he gives another illustration. But the very hair of your head are all numbered. He knows every hair on your head. I woke up this morning after reading this and getting ready, and I saw a bunch more in the sink. Uh, Lord, that's less you have to count. They say that there's an average of 144,000 hairs on the head. My grandson, Liam, has probably 288,000. He was just born in December, and he is the hairiest kid I have ever seen. I mean, his head, I mean, I'm literally like this long already, all over, and his eyebrows are like this. And I'm holding him, and I'm like, you're a little man. <laughs> you are hairy. And I got a chance to hold him, and I'm just looking. His eyes are kind of like, a, I don't know yet, they're, uh, grayish green uh, they just pierce your soul when you look at him and you're going what are you thinking because I don't like it <laughs> you know? and the Lord just told me at that moment and I, I'm going to share it um, unfortunately I'll be dead before you know if I'm a false prophet or not but the Lord just told me he's going to be a preacher he just told me that and so without anyone really knowing, I was praying for him I go Lord anoint him and I impart to him the gifts that you've given me and and I ask that you use this uh, person and just pouring into him <clears throat> and he's just looking at me and I thought wow Lord that would be awesome to see him grow up to be a preacher I won't be around but it would be awesome so many hairs and I know that some of us don't have that much hair the loss of one single hair from your head God knows that it falls that's insignificant when you really think about because most of us don't even notice it right you know you, you comb your hair and you don't realize you just lost 20 you know or 30 some of you might now because you have less. And that's usually the age of 50 and over when you start realizing, I am really losing a lot of hair. And then so you start looking into products that thicken your hair, products that make your hair fluff out. You know, you don't use gels anymore because when you do, it separates or it sticks your hair together and it really makes you look like you have no hair. And then you think it's time for Rogaine. You know. Jesus is saying that people are more important than animals, than hair, right? I was reading an article, and it was kind of funny. And I know there's some horse people here, so I don't mean to offend you, but it is interesting that people love their animals more than they love their, their spouses. They love other things more than their spouses. Because I've seen people divorce their spouses over an animal. And this little article was about a horse disease that's going around. And it's in the hair of the horse. And it seems to be affecting women. And, and the article goes on, so be careful because of all of a sudden, and these are the symptoms, is, is the wife begins to have a lack of interest in cooking, a lack of interest in cleaning. She's spending a lot of time with her hair, with, with her horse, you know, and it goes on and just explains that. I just started busting up. I showed Virginia and, and her mom, and I thought, wow. It's like, what an observation, and you find it's true from time to time. We put, you, you know people who value their animals more than people that is not what jesus is teaching here he's saying i love people more than i love animals i love you more than i love animals i'll take care of birds i'll feed them 
for your pleasure, but I love you more than them. You should love your spouse more than anything else. That is a commandment. That has nothing to do with your choice or your will. You should do that. How concerned are you about getting the gospel out, preaching it and not being fearful? <clears throat> See, this text here is not promising that you won't lose your hair, but you will. And the point is, is that Jesus, who loves you very much, will be there for you. So he says for the third time in verse 31, do not fear, therefore. Don't fear. And the word therefore introduces the consequences of the evidence that God cares for you. Because God cares for you, don't worry about what other people are saying. He is in total control. Are you not more valuable than many sparrows? Of course you are. And so now he gets to the meat of why he said all this. Verse 32 to 33. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him or de deny before my Father in heaven who is in heaven. So he gives us two things here. They call them with uh, dual parallelisms, which uh, basically says confession before others means confession before God. Denial before others means denial before God. What is he saying there, though? Is he saying that if you confess me before men, then my Father will confess you? If you deny me before men, then my Father will deny you, and you will be separated from him for eternity. A commentator, Robinson, uh, denies that this passage has any uh, has in view rewards rather than punishment. And so God may be dealing with rewards. In other words, if you deny me, then my Father's going to deny you rewards that are in heaven. I don't know if it says that or not, and I know it doesn't say that he'll judge you either, but that is the debate that's out there right now. Is he talking about judgment or is he talking about rewards? I believe in verse 32, as it says, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, I will... I him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. I believe that, that when he's talking here, I think he's being very unclear, but yet clear that he's talking about our relationship with the Father. Now, I am one that believes this, and I may be wrong. It brings up the issue of when saved, always saved, Calvinism, Arminianism, and I totally get both. Uh, if you proclaim Jesus as your Savior, you're saved, that's it. Nothing's going to take you away. You, you, nothing can snatch you out of his hand. But I think that you can walk out of his hand. I think you have a choice to deny him. I think you have a choice to say, that's it. I'm done. I'm not doing this ever again and turn back to the world. But then that brings up the question, well, then maybe you were never saved. You never had a relationship with God. It was just religion. Or that God can lose you that he can separate you. And I know some believe that. I think that if you love God, if you really love God, and if you've given your heart to God because you're in love with him, you're going to confess him. Nothing's going to stop you because you're totally surrendered to him and you love him completely. I can walk down the street with my wife, wherever it's at, Newport or at the mall. I can hold her hand and people know I love her. And I love her to death. Thursdays is our day. I'll still take calls, but that's our day. And we just get away where, wherever that is. And it is our day. And you know I love her. She is my everything. In fact, I tell her all the time, I hope that I die first. Because if you die, I'm not going to make it. Because I need you more than anything. Except God. And I know God will get me through. But that's how I feel about her. But you know I love her. And I really believe that if you really love God, you're going to share that love with others. You're going to make known that love to others because you love him. But on the same token, if you don't love God, it will show because you're not sharing. And if you're not sharing, if you're not letting people know, then God says, well, I don't know you anyway. But Lord, Lord, did we not do this? Did we not do that? And he opens the door and looks, I don't know who you are. You're a worker of iniquity. 
the works that you did were works like Cain. They were your own works. They weren't works that I required. They were works that you thought I'd be happy with, and I'm not happy with them. He wants obedience to the word of God. <clears throat> he wants his name proclaimed. He wants love and devotion and surrender to his life. And so there's a possibility that if you don't confess him before men, he won't confess you because you weren't his in the first place. And you know that because you don't show that love. You can see when two people are not loving each other. It's evident. You don't need anyone proclaiming it. I mean, people can feel it in the air, you know? And that's sad because you should. And you could regain that love, by the way, uh, because there was a time where you didn't even know each other or loved each other, and God gave you that love for one another. And it starts by remembering your first love, uh, committing to one another, trusting one another, um, not being that drippy faucet that Proverbs talks about, you know? Uh, being kind to one another, loving your wife. I really believe that a lot of it is the men. The men need to really crucify their flesh. I know that a lot of times it was me. In fact, most of the time it was me and not my wife. I always had to look at myself. Oh, I'd get mad. I don't understand why she doesn't see it. And I'd walk away and not talk for days. But ultimately God would humble me and say, you're the head of the home. Humble yourself, forgive. It doesn't matter which way you roll the toilet paper, you know, which way you squeeze the toothpaste out of the tube. See, I'm very, and you already know this, I, I'm very um, organized, you know, I like everything in order, ver very picky, and so when I take that toothpaste, I fold each end up and squeeze it through and, and I keep folding until that fold is all the way to the end and I'm squeezing it right out of the sides. And it took years for her to learn that, but she's learned it. And now I even use her, her little hair pieces to clip the end so it doesn't unfold because I hate that. It's messy. You know. And you realize, yeah, those of you that are going to get married, uh, hang on, it gets worse. <laughs> you come home and like, really, you made that? It's like, why would I even say that? After I pray, thank you, Lord, for this food. <laughs> you know, and so God had to humble me and, and I had to realize it's me. It's not her. It has to do with me. I have to have the right perspective, the right love, the right understanding of her and of my relationship, my role and so forth. It's all about me. And by the way, it's you too. It's you too. It, it's all of us humbling ourselves and realizing what is important and what is not important in our lives. When you don't love each other, you can see it. And that means you don't know each other. And God doesn't know you if you're not proclaiming him to the world. Let me, let me close <clears throat> just with one thought, and I think it's pretty self-explanatory. There's no point in having followers who do not follow you. If you're not following Jesus, you're not a follower of Jesus. It's plain and simple. And so Jesus doesn't know you. If you're following Jesus, then you're a follower of Jesus and he knows you and he'll proclaim you when you get to heaven. And that principle is true in our walk with him. If we know Jesus, boy, we want to know him. We want to be in love with him. We want to please him in everything. And that means in our roles with one another, our roles in church. Because if you are a follower of Jesus and you're following him, then you are a follower. If you are a follower of this church, by the way, and I'll, let me just be very clear and honest here. If you are a follower here in this church, you belong to this church, God called you here in this church, then your heart will be in this church and nowhere else. This church will have priority in your life because this is where you know God has called you and God wants to use you to glorify himself in this community. But if you are all over the place, <clears throat> who are you following? Your heart's divided. You can't have a divided heart. <clears throat> it, it runs you weary and that's why you get weary because you're not following Jesus. You're not following his plan so be his follower and you're safe, right? John 15, if you abide in me, I'll abide in you. And then you don't have to worry whether he will proclaim you or not, whether he will 
separate you eternally. Is it speaking of judgment? It could possibly be that you don't know him and, and you will stand in judgment. You will be the, the uh, shaft that will be burnt. Or it me could mean that your rewards are very little and what you're doing on earth is minimal. In fact, you're not doing much and so you're getting to heaven like the thief on the cross by grace. You just got in by the skin of your teeth. We thought, like, is there skin on teeth? Oh, that's why they say that because there's hardly any skin by the skin of your teeth. So what do we want to do? We want to follow Jesus. We want to be a disciple of Jesus. And everything else, I really believe this, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all his righteousness, that's having a relationship with him, everything else will fall into place. We have to do that. And it is sad. And I'll say this as a pastor, again, not as a teacher, but as a pastor. When you see young men and women and couples in this church, and I know it happens in all churches, and it's the heart of every pastor. When you see them coming to know Jesus, serving and loving and then falling away for something else. That is the hardest thing for a pastor to receive. It, it hurts deeply. It really does. You may not see it, and I may not say it all the time, but it hurts to see men and women walk away from the Lord. I just, we were at a party yesterday and um, way out in Moreno Valley, so you never know. All of a sudden I get a tap on the shoulder, I look over, I'm like, whoa, whoa. Hey, Pastor Reuben, and they used to go to the church years ago. And the first thing in my head was, man, why aren't you in church? I, mean, I was glad to see him and everything, but he was like, oh, we're doing good. Everything's fine. We're, ha we're living life. And I'm like, wow, that's too bad. It hurt. But I was cordial. You know, hey, nice seeing you. We love you. God bless. That's the hardest thing to see when you pour into someone. Because you want them to be followers of Jesus all the way to the end. Don't give up. Don't stop. There's always hope. Keep hanging on to Jesus. Keep going forward. He's the answer.